Hello everybody, welcome to the 20 episode series analyzing every angle and detail surrounding the 13,383 children. The 13,383 children that were spared in the transitional period between the end of the roast game era and the beginning of the post-roast game era, a time period that consists of 364 days between December 26th 2016 and December 24th, 2017, an era I will dub as the X Roast Game Era. In this episode, I will simply introduce the series, the list of episodes, and the schedule for each as these episodes pop up on my channel to premiere as I'm done with making each. Here is the list of the 20 episodes. Episode 1, Introduction, which is this one. Episode 2, What Led Up to the X Roast Game Era in 364 Days. 3, Demographics slash Statistics Introduction, the first two mini-segments of the series. Episode 4, Demographics, Gender and Race. Episode 5, Demographics, Religion and Family Background. Episode 6, Demographics age episode 7 statistics counting off other child deaths from knife wounds murder etc episode 8 statistics matching up demographics gender race religion family background and age episode 9 statistics putting it all into perspective episode 10 trauma emotional episode 11 trauma psychological episode 12 trauma mental and conclusion of mini segment episode 13 recapping demographics First mini segment. Episode 14, recapping statistics. Second mini segment. Episode 15, recapping trauma. Third mini segment. Episode 16, gory and forensic aftermath that's left behind. Rant segment. Episode 17, what happens next now? Short commentary. Teaser for episode 18. Episode 18, the beginning of the post roast game era. December 25th, 2017. Episode 19, Final Commentary Slash Rant Video. And Episode 20, Series Finale Slash Recap Slash Conclusion. I will be as simplistic but factually detailed and accurate at the same time. So without further ado, let the series begin. I am Detective Brian Mullins the Fox signing out. See you then. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox. I am going to explain in a more simplistic way what led up to the X Roast Game Era, which is a 364 day period between December 26th, 2016 and December 24th, 2017. Right after the last Roast Game Christmas on December 25th, 2016, and a month or so after the 2016 election, Christmas dinner was no longer seen as a uniting tradition. Dividing relationships, entire family splitting up, and ending the roast game era in the most divisive way imaginable. Unity was needed for the roast game as a now past tradition to keep alive back then. If divisions weren't like that, the roast game would have continued well into the 2020 as a phenomenon. There really was no unity at all at that time. Since children were no longer as special, they were not special at all either. So throughout the quiet after the massive 18 Christmas or 19 year bloodstorm for the dumbest of fucking reasons for not believing in Christmas, it was mostly peaceful. Throughout this entire 364 day timeline, only 13,383 children were spared. These 13,383 children that would have added to the 18,568,322 that already went away are the ones that will live a mentally shaky and challenging life ahead of all of this. Crying and having a temper tantrum every now and then for hours. Crying over being told that they're special even when they're not, etc. This can happen for any reason. Not saying that this is direct proof of trauma from the past. But a few of what I've mentioned can trigger PTSD. There were attempts from people that tried to slaughter these 13,383 children for not believing in Christmas. They will also have physical wounds that'll rather disable them for the rest of their lives. Having part of their ass cut off but not all of it, which they can end up in a wheelchair or they would die from fatal infection from the knife wounds, or if not, deep gashes and stabs within the ass. 
or other debilitating factors that I have not mentioned yet and will not mention because they're so diverse and so few and far between that they would be a rarity to cast your sight upon. Now, let's get into the statistics and all that other jazz in the next episode. I'm Brian Mullins, the Fox, signing out. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox. Welcome to episode 3 of Among the 13,383 Children. Let's introduce what we'll be covering throughout these two mini-segments. First, let's get into demographics. In the next three episodes, we'll be going over gender and race, religion and family background, and finally, age. Here are the sources we'll work with throughout these next three episodes. Number one, The Roast Game, Numbers by the Year, 1998 to 2016, the source for the 13,383 number. And number two, The Roast Game Death Toll, but in a much smaller yet equally accurate scale to account for the 13,383 children that were rightfully spared albeit with a hell of a lot of PTSD to cope with throughout their lives as they grow up. The next three episodes after that, we'll get into statistics, counting off other child deaths from knife wounds, murder, etc., matching up demographics, gender, race, religion, family background, and age, and finally putting it all into perspective. Until then, I'm Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. See you then. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox. Let's get into gender and race. We'll do all of this by using the percentages of the roast game death toll by gender and race and analyzing the 13,383 children that were spared that way. Let's start with gender. Male, 68.9% of the 13,383 or 9,221 of them. Female, 31.1% of the 13,383 or 4,162. All of this obviously adds up to 13,383. Let's continue with race. White, 64.1% of 13,383 or 8,578 of them. African American or Black, 29% of 13,383 or 3,881 of them. Hispanic, 1% 1 of 13,383 or 134 of them. Asian American, 203 of them. Other races, 5.9% of 13,383, but excluding Asian Americans from the bunch, of which I've already accounted for. 587. The total amount of children that were spared by race adds up perfectly to 13,383. In the next episode, we'll get into religion and family background. I'm Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. See you then. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox. Let's do the same thing methodology-wise, but covering religion and family background. Religion. Obviously all of them Christian of all denominations. 13,383. Family background. The number of children that would have been killed by a single mother? 5,326 children. The number of children that would have been killed by a single father? 1,164 children. The number of children that would have been killed by a married mother for not believing in Christmas? 3,640 of them. And finally, the number of children that would have been killed by a married father for not believing in Christmas? 3,253 of them. In total, it obviously adds up to 13,383. And the same amount of children were spared during the X-Roast game era as usual. In the next episode, we'll get into the final demographic, age. I'm Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. See you then. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox. Let's get into the last part of the demographic nitty gritty. Age groups. Under a year old. 3,418 children would have been slaughtered in 2017 for not believing in Christmas. 6,433 of them being under the age of 5 or between the ages of 1 and 5. 
1,772 of them between the ages of 6 and 11, 1,760 of them being between the ages of 12 and 17 are children by law. All this obviously adding up to 13,383. In the next episode, we'll get into more interesting territory. Statistics. I am Brian Mullins, the Fox, signing out. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox. Welcome to the mini-segment that will likely take the longest time to demonstrate the undying importance of. Statistics. Before we get down to number crunching, let's fully get to know what we're cutting off the death toll to get to 13,383. According to the Annie E. Casey Foundation's Kids Count Data Center, here's the supposed total amount of child deaths between 2016 and 2017. These are the only deaths that have been quote-unquote documented, but there were a lot of other child deaths that were not taken into account for obvious reasons. Even though just going down the page to see the disclaimers and takeaways can easily have us fully assure ourselves that we can take the data with a massive grain of salt and even bullshit. The difference between the children that were actually spared and the supposed total amount of child deaths between 2016 and 2017 is 5,616. According to CDC stacks, here are some more statistics to pause the video for. This episode is clearly to not include these irrelevant deaths. The 13,383 prevented deaths are what we're talking about. So adding all these numbers up that is within this red box, then dividing 13,383 by 42,672 gives me the fact that about 31.4% of the overall deaths the age of under 1 to 15 to 19 were prevented. But just because those deaths were prevented does not at all mean that you can say the same when it comes to the bodily, emotional, and mental trauma they faced. The absolutely, literally, ass-shredding trauma will be covered later in the series in another mini-segment known as Trauma. But until then, and until the next episode, I am Brian Mullins the Fox signing out. See you then. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome to Among the 13,383 Children. Welcome to Episode 8, Statistics, Matching Up Demographics by Compiling Them, and Episode 9 will be something special. We will put it all into perspective by ending the mini-segment. All of these numbers are based on the roast game death toll, but these 13,383 children, like I've said countless times before, have been spared or survived any further attempt of a roast game slaughter that failed. And here are the clips that I'm going to be compiling. Let's start with gender. Male, 68.9% of the 13,383, or 9,221 of them. Female, 31.1% of the 13,383, or 4,162. Let's continue with race. White, 64.1% of 13,383, or 8,578 of them. African American or Black, 29% of 13,383, or 3,881 of them. Hispanic, 1% of 13,383, or 134 of them. Asian American, 203 of them. 
other races, 5.9% of 13,383, but excluding Asian Americans from the bunch, of which I've already accounted for. 587. Religion. Obviously all of them Christian of all denominations. 13,383. Family background. The number of children that would have been killed by a single mother? 5,326 children. The number of children that would have been killed by a single father? 1,164 children. The number of children that would have been killed by a married mother for not believing in Christmas? 3,640 of them. And finally, the number of children that would have been killed by a married father for not believing in Christmas? 3,253 of them. Under a year old, 3,418 children would have been slaughtered in 2017 for not believing in Christmas. 6,433 of them being under the age of 5 or between the ages of 1 and 5. 1,772 of them between the ages of 6 and 11. 1,760 of them being between the ages of 12 and 17 are children by law. I am Brian Mullins, the Fox, signing out. Hi everybody, it's me, Brian Mullins the Fox here, with episode 9 of Among the 13,383 Children. I'm putting it all into perspective before I end this mini-segment and head into what will be the easiest mini-segment to cover, called Trauma. And then I'll start recapping these mini-segments, go into the gory and forensic aftermath that's left behind in a rant segment in episode 16, give a teaser for episode 18 in What Happens Next Now. Episode 19 will have a final commentary slash rant segment for the series. And episode 20 will just conclude it all. It's good to know that the hardest part of the entire series is finally over. But I will use clips of older recordings of mine when it comes to the last mini-segment in this series called Trauma. The big catch here is that if these 13,383 deaths would have happened, it would have only added to the roast game death toll, which thankfully didn't. That's the only thing here. So before I end this episode and this mini-segment known as Statistics, I want to thank you all for watching. I want you to make sure you keep hitting that notification bell for future episodes so I can continue these series or these playlists on YouTube. I'm Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, and welcome to Among the 13,383 Children. Welcome to the Trauma mini-segment, which is the last mini-segment of this entire series. For the emotional segment in this episode, which is episode 10, I'll swiftly go deep into the emotional aspect of the trauma. 
after the child suffers the trauma of having known that these parents would have taken them out, they're emotionally scarred for life. They will never see objects like knives the same way ever again. They'll never see Christmas the same way again. And most importantly, they'll never see the centerpiece of Christmas dinner the same way ever again. Outside of that, here are some of these clips and videos I will show to you now. But just think about how emotionally and psychologically impactful it is to demonstrate and demonstrably prove just how much of their life is a lie. To be honest and truthful, there is no absolute way that we can dredge up and sum up in the most specific way how many people specifically committed suicide simply because they fully and mentally embodied and acknowledged how much of a lie their life truly or apparently is or was. Even if there are some, it's hard or if not borderline impossible to be exact with the suicide count. Let's just not focus too much on that stupid holiday suicide myth anyway. Let's avoid doing that throughout the series. By the way, this will be a three-part series. It's not going to be too long. I'm going to clip a video that I already made a while back about how we raise our kids to die. The link to the original video will be in the description box down below. Why would suicides surrounding this topic or the topic of the roast game be so low or insignificant? Because they would only find out about all of this now, and it wouldn't even affect them that much or affect them at all. Nobody really cares about the specific reason why one would bother killing themselves other than just maybe, just maybe, some shitty people or trolls on the internet constantly pushing some people unfortunate enough to end one's life. Since children were no longer as special, they were not special at all either. So throughout the quiet after the massive 18 Christmas or 19 year bloodstorm for the dumbest of fucking reasons for not believing in Christmas, it was mostly peaceful. Throughout this entire 364 day timeline, only 13,383 children were spared. These 13,383 children that would have added to the 18,568,322 that already went away are the ones that will live a mentally shaky and challenging life ahead of all of this. Crying and having a temper tantrum every now and then for hours. Crying over being told that they're special even when they're not, etc. This can happen for any reason. Not saying that this is direct proof of trauma from the past but a few of what I've mentioned can trigger PTSD. There were attempts from people that tried to slaughter these 13,383 children for not believing in Christmas. They will also have physical wounds that'll rather disable them for the rest of their lives. Having part of their ass cut off but not all of it, which they can end up in a wheelchair, or they would die from fatal infection from the knife wounds, or if not, deep gashes and stabs within the ass. Or other debilitating factors that I have not mentioned yet and will not mention because they're so diverse and so few and far between that they would be a rarity to cast your sight upon. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, and welcome to episode 11 of Among the 13,383 Children. In this trauma mini-segment, we'll talk about the psychological impacts of what would have happened to these children. 
again, like last episode, they'll never see Knives, Christmas itself, and the centerpiece of Christmas dinner the same way ever again. But let's get to the psychological side of that. They'll be afraid of how crazy their parents can be. They'll be afraid of Christmas. They'll be afraid of so much as Santa Claus, Rudolph, Frosty, anything relating to Christmas or anything relating to the phenomenon beforehand that they would have been additional casualties to. The roast game. But outside of that, I've already talked about the psychological, emotional, and statistical impacts of the topic of the roast game. Here's a clip or two. And now, I will go through the psychological aspect of it all. What would make anybody, in any way, try to attack, shut down, or deride the person or topic that is discussed? Why would it be so controversial that a debating website's very debate and forum page activity was slowed down to a crawl? Why else would the phrase conspiracy theorist be used to attack the character of the individual bringing the topic to light? Either to control the narrative surrounding the conversation slash situation, or worse, doing that and theorizing your own conspiracy theory at the same time. All of those questions revert back to one simple answer. Needless hostility. This type of hostility is similar to what flat earthers hold as quote-unquote grudges towards people that either laugh at other people making fun of their archaic and disproven beliefs, or towards people who utterly dismantle and destroy the already debunked belief of a flat earth. And a needless cover-up, supposedly by NASA and the UN, while at the same time it supposedly dates back to antiquity. No conspiracy is needed to understand why people believe in inane, dumb, thunderously retarded bullshit. And I'm going to continue to degrade any self-degraded, good-for-nothing idiot who peddles conspiracy theories with the likes of Alex Jones. I've covered, and at least noticed, the level of hostility, delusion, and just downright cope. A perfect example of the absolute cope over such a thunderously controversial, yet incontrovertible fact known as the roast game is Dark Prince in the comment section of a debate.org debate, the second roast game debate, which was held on November 29th, 2017, and finished up several days later. Going off on tirade after tirade, whining, bitching, and moaning about just imagining a claim as thunderous as this. All the past roast game dramas demonstrate that the political and social climate slash environment surrounding the topic of the roast game was one of, and with needless hostility, and false accusations of a conspiracy against the individual, albeit me, bringing this topic to light. The phrase, CONSPIRACY THEORIST, as I have demonstrated time and time again, is a self-contradictory ad hominem attack slash fallacy. I got banned from debate.org, which doesn't exist and isn't online anymore, with all the rage, hostility, kill yourself comments, and death threats as a perfect example of the toxic environment surrounding me and the topic itself. All of this was just the psychological aftermath of me having discussed or talked about this topic at all. I've had people belittle, harass, and even slander me, accuse me of making money off of art that I don't even fucking own because they were too retarded to understand exactly how the paid promotion option is or works. Because clearly, nobody, let alone Dakota himself, has ever sponsored me to use art commissions of his. None whatsoever. That wasn't his original works in the first place. It was the artists that he commissioned to make art for him. You dumbasses. A lot of stupid people believed that I did hook, line, and sinker. From a fake Jew, a Catholic, an edgelord, and a conservative reactionary who's too retarded to even realize how much of a gigantic hypocrite he is all the way up until he deletes all the response videos and doesn't even admit everything. I had some conservative teenage asshat try to assassinate my character with conspiratorial talking points. The conspiracy theory narrative and outright quote-unquote no you response videos that fail to even address anything outside of the roast game theory by saying that he's just a theory and being a disingenuous prick to not just me and my audience but his quote-unquote audience or lack thereof. All of these are just examples. I don't need to go on any further.
Hello, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, and welcome to episode 12 of Among the 13,383 Children. This is the final part of the last mini-segment of this entire series. For episodes 13, 14, and 15, I'll just be clipping and recapping the last three mini-segments, and then tying each of them in a uniquely tied bow. And then, episodes 16... 17, 18, 19, and 20 will require original input and output for commentary and ranting. The mental consequences, just like the psychological and emotional consequences like I've explained before, play as part of the experience of trauma. And they'll have irrational fears, and even when they're grown up in the next 10-15 years, they will still have those memories. And likely as of then, they'll even recognize me and their trauma when they were kids. Jeez, what a horrible experience you all have faced. If you all recognize me 10 to 15 years later, that would be a little weird, creepy, and even mortifying to say the least. But that'll do it for this entire last mini-segment. I am Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. I'll see you with more original commentary and all the work starting in episode 16. Bye. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox. First, let's get into demographics. In the next three episodes, we'll be going over gender and race, religion and family background, and finally, age. Here are the sources we'll work with throughout these next three episodes. Number one, The Roast Game. Numbers by the year, 1998 to 2016. The source for the 13,383 number. And number two, The Roast Game Death Toll but in a much smaller yet equally accurate scale to account for the 13,383 children that were rightfully spared, albeit with a hell of a lot of PTSD to cope with throughout their lives as they grow up. Let's start with gender. Male, 68.9% of the 13,383 or 9,221 of them. Female, 31.1% of the 13,383 or 4,162. Let's continue with race. White, 64.1% of 13,383, or 8,578 of them. African American, or black, 29% of 13,383, or 3,881 of them. Hispanic, 1% 1 of 13,383, or 134 of them. Asian American, 203 of them. Other races, 5.9% of 13,383, but excluding Asian Americans from the bunch, of which I've already accounted for. 587. Religion, obviously all of them Christian of all denominations, 13,383. Family background, the number of children that would have been killed by a single mother, 5,326 children. The number of children that would have been killed by a single father, 1,164 children. The number of children that would have been killed by a married mother for not believing in Christmas, 3,640 of them. And finally, the number of children that would have been killed by a married father for not believing in Christmas, 3,253 of them. Under a year old, 3,418 children would have been slaughtered in 2017 for not believing in Christmas. 6,433 of them being under the age of 5 or between the ages of 1 and 5. 1,772 of them between the ages of 6 and 11. 1,760 of them being between the ages of 12 and 17 are children by law. I am Brian Mullins, the Fox, signing out. <laughs>
Welcome to the mini segment that will likely take the longest time to demonstrate the undying importance of statistics. Before we get down to number crunching, let's fully get to know what we're cutting off the death toll to get to 13,383. According to the Annie E. Casey Foundation's Kids Count Data Center, here's the supposed total amount of child deaths between 2016 and 2017. These are the only deaths that have been quote-unquote documented, but there were a lot of other child deaths that were not taken into account for obvious reasons. Even though just going down the page to see the disclaimers and takeaways can easily have us fully assure ourselves that we can take the data with a massive grain of salt and even bullshit. The difference between the children that were actually spared and the supposed total amount of child deaths between 2016 and 2017 is 5,616. According to CDC stacks, here are some more statistics to pause the video for. So adding all these numbers up that is within this red box, then dividing 13,383 by 42,672 gives me the fact that about 31.4% of the overall deaths the age of under 1 to 15 to 19 were prevented. But just because those deaths were prevented does not at all mean that you can say the same when it comes to the bodily, emotional, and mental trauma they faced. The absolutely, literally, ass-shredding trauma will be covered later in the series in another mini-segment known as Trauma. Hello everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox, and welcome to Among the 13,383 Children. Welcome to the trauma mini-segment. I'll swiftly go deep into the emotional aspect of the trauma. After the child suffers the trauma of having known that these parents would have taken them out, they're emotionally scarred for life. They will never see objects like knives the same way ever again. They'll never see Christmas the same way again. And most importantly, they'll never see the centerpiece of Christmas dinner the same way ever again. Outside of that, they'll be afraid of how crazy their parents can be. They'll be afraid of Christmas. They'll be afraid of so much as Santa Claus, Rudolph, Frosty, anything relating to Christmas or anything relating to the phenomenon beforehand that they would have been additional casualties to, the roast game. But outside of that, I've already talked about the psychological, emotional, and statistical impacts of the topic of the roast game. The mental consequences, just like the psychological and emotional consequences like I've explained before, play as part of the experience of trauma. And they'll have irrational fears, and even when they're grown up in the next 10-15 years, they will still have those memories. And likely as of then, they'll even recognize me and their trauma when they were kids. Jeez, what a horrible experience you all have faced. If you all recognize me 10 to 15 years later, that would be a little weird, creepy, and even mortifying to say the least. But that'll do it for this entire last mini-segment. I am Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. I'll see you with more original commentary and all the work starting in episode 16. Bye.
Hi, everybody. I am Brian Mullins the Fox. Welcome to Among the 13,383 Children, Episode 16, Gory and Forensic Aftermath That's Left Behind, Rant Segment. And by the way, this is the first rant segment episode. I will cover the gory and forensic aftermath that's left behind before I move on for the rest of the series. I am not going to be talking about the roast game theory. I'm not going to be talking about the hypothetical fridge audit idea I entertained in 2022. And I'm certainly not talking about that cursed mobile home in New Lexington, Ohio. Because those only concern cases when the roast game was a phenomenon in the past. Even though the X-Roast game era, when it comes to everything else, was mostly peaceful, it still does not mean that it was peaceful for everybody, much less these 13,383 children who would have added to the roast game death toll. And for those who are still confused, just think. Please think for fuck's sake. And don't even dare try to argue against or deny any of this being a fact of life for these children. Because it is. I'm talking about the blood stains and smears that are much less gory, but it is still equally as brutal as when the roast game was a phenomenon that happened in the past. We're talking about the ex-roast game era, that one period of time in between the roast game era and the post-roast game era. I'm talking about the shit stains smeared either all over a wall, the floor, or even splattered some portion of it on the ceiling. I know that's brutal, downright savage, and absolutely gross. What's left behind if any of these stains aren't or weren't cleaned up at all, what will continuously remind all of them the room that they all would have died in had it not been for these families or family members suddenly having a complete change of heart when it's seemingly convenient. What's left behind for them to do when they all grow up is to find out for themselves what the fuck it is that would have happened to them. All these boys and girls now will never fully know or develop cognitive abilities to fully grasp what would have fully happened to them. These stains will remind them of the time that they would have laid bare and died on the floor, like you were some afterthought of convenience for some arbitrary centerpiece meat choice for Christmas dinner. These stains will scar them for life. I don't give a fuck what any slack job idiot says on the internet, trying to argue the contrary. You're not an expert on trauma. Either of you think that pretending that you would even need to be is required to be a quote-unquote expert in the first place. Pretty sad, isn't it? Isn't it such a goddamn crying shame that absolutely nobody cares? That these children, be they white, black, Hispanic, Asian, male, and or female, will have to live with either being adopted, being orphans, or living behind times for the rest of their lives? These children will never truly live and feel that they are living fruitful lives at the same time, unlike the rest of the children that ironically survived through the roast game era with divided families, unwanted presents, food needlessly wasted, or worse, fearing that their house was on the verge of burning down to the ground and being homeless as a result in the middle of a brutal winter in the process. These children that survived throughout all of this, living as part of the first ever generation with no purpose, are afraid that the vast majority of their lives were complete and total lies. Their parents will never see through them because it's not what they see that's the problem with them. It's what the kids know that the parents don't. That the parents don't. And I highly doubt that these quote-unquote parents would have all the courage they even want to show to care about it without needlessly making their lives a living hell by either they're egotistically gaslighting them out of the conversation, leaving them homeless, threatening them with financially pulling out of their lives at the worst time, or worst, just like for these 13,383 children, taking them out entirely as well. Don't you people owe it to whatever community on the internet or real life that you were a part of to think of something fucking better than that for their lives? I would be ashamed to even exist. I would have been born decades earlier. I would have been a much more privileged son of a bitch than these unfortunate fucks that have had to survive with most of them being in a wheelchair with a scarred or fucked up ass and with no financial support from these heartless, shameless, or pointless excuses for existences that you would call parents. Denying their existence as children that survived possibly the worst way to go out for the dumbest of fucking reasons is like the VA putting one of their own soldiers down for not believing in the very freedom they're told to protect and fight for. And for those who get to live hereafter, the trauma is still there. It is absolutely rare enough 
for most of the population to truly care, and nothing is going to change for these people, let alone children. Nothing will ever fucking change for these children, and that's why it's all so sad. I would have known all of this much sooner than I did had it not been for me being too young or being blindly Christian and downright ignorant. I had either the right to live a lie and regret all of what I should have known, or I have the right to be left decomposed and rot after being slaughtered for not believing in Christmas like a fucking animal. I get chills from all of this now. That's interesting. But you know what's more interesting than all I've provided so far into this series? What the next episode will tease for episode 18. And with all that being said, I am Brian Mullins the Fox signing out. See you in episode 18. When it comes to this mini-series, analyzing the short-lived era, of all the eras Brian analyzed himself, all we need to know is, what happens next now for these children? They've been through the trauma, physical abuse, blood loss, and everything else that insults their existence among many other reasons. Again, before I end this video, what happens next now? Hi everybody, I am Brian Mullins the Fox. Welcome to episode 18 of Among the 13,383 Children. We're now going to cover what will be considered the end of the X roast game era, a transitional time period between the roast game era and the post roast game era. What began as a phase of trauma for a would-be Christmas roast casualty, or a roast game casualty, surviving and healing against all odds, is what will end with the beginning of the post roast game era, which began on Christmas Day 2017. Which is why I said that another roast game Christmas never happened in 2017, or simply Christmas never really happened in 2017, the way it did before. But what really led up to this sudden change of heart from families? What led to this massive fallout when it comes to the grand scheme of things, even on debate.org? Who was behind all this? that made a difference. It was me. The topic of the roast game was first introduced on October 17th, 2017, but the debate didn't take place until three days later. After this transitional phase and before the beginning of the post-roast game era, I, as of the time, Brian Mullins No Christmas 2, on October 20th, 2017, started the first ever roast game debate on the now defunct website known as debate.org, which I won by seven points. I'll show the clip. Let's analyze the first debate which is called Brian Mullins' The Roast Game. Families were eating their own children for 19 years. I start the debate with, The Roast Game is pretty simple. First, ask any family member what is special about a holiday roast. The family member would have the tendency to guess assumptively, ham, turkey, beef. You say no to the family member. Then you ask them, who or what do you think is special? The family member says, I believe that children are special. You respond, so you eat children for a Christmas roast. The family member would freak out at you because he knew that the family ate children and he is surprised that you knew it too. The whole point of the game is to get your point across, which is the idea that the family eats children as their Christmas roast and you interview and prove your common knowing and realizing of the idea or tradition that families have. If they freak out, they already admitted it. And here is the instrumental song that I used as a source. Then Yana Girl 136 steps in with her first round in this debate. 
I literally have no clue what this is supposed to be about. Nothing that the person who was pro or for this posted makes any sense to me, nor the person who attempted to explain it to me. That's that. Whoops. Then I step out with my last round in this debate. It does make sense, but you don't understand it. It's a psychological will tester, testing their will to tell the truth. Like asking them, what is special about a holiday roast? And them guessing as a response, ham, chicken, turkey, beef. You tell them no, because they don't realize the point you're trying to get across their heads. Because they think they can get away with eating children. But suddenly you ask them another question like, who or what do you think is special? Then they answer with this response, children and believing that children are special which you respond to that with so you guys eat children as your christmas roast which gets them the freak out this whole topic is about getting your whole point across and at the same time proving not provence pardon the spelling error proving the truth in which i did with that long comment i made in the comment section below i made my point clear so vote for pro Finally, in desperation, Yana Girl 136 posts. You know what? This was a pointless, confusing, stupid debate, and I don't honestly care if I lose. There, I said it. And I won the debate by seven points because of this vote, in which Jim Shady states basically a forfeit. I mean, she said she doesn't care if she loses. After that, I had the second roast game debate, known as Should Christmas End? on November 29th, 2017. The fallout throughout the time the second debate was taking place was absolutely insane. But now, let's get back to the most important point of the video, the beginning of the post-roast game era. I never knew as of then how much of an impact those two debates had in the real world. I never knew that a random church bus would randomly park right where my apartment is for some weird reason. If it's totally not for stalking me or anything like that. I'm not accusing anybody of stalking. But it's just awkward how cars just randomly park right where my apartment is back in 2017. Where I had to open the front door and see what was going on through the screen door. On Christmas Day 2017, after 20 years of not staying true to Christmas, dinner traditions, they finally went back to either turkey or ham as the centerpiece of Christmas dinner nationwide in both America and Canada. But let's only talk about American consumption and waste statistics. For turkey, 22,215,167 turkeys were consumed as of the Christmas of 2017. However, the amount that were wasted and not consumed at all was only 19,956,972. For ham, on the other hand, 13,545,833 of them were consumed as of the Christmas of 2017, while only 29,714,716 were wasted and shows that the waste consumption stats have changed a lot in comparison to 2016, or to be more accurate, changed entirely. What happens next now for these 13,383 children? They're left behind to marinade in their own emotions and bouts of PTSD-induced mental breakdowns. And that's about it. On the next episode of this wonderful miniseries, I'll recap everything in this one series, and I'll see you in episode 20 whilst I recap it for a final time. I'm Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. <laughs>
and finally age. Here are the sources we'll work with throughout these next three episodes. Number one, The Roast Game, Numbers by the Year, 1998 to 2016, the source for the 13,383 number. And number two, The Roast Game Death Toll, but in a much smaller yet equally accurate scale to account for the 13,383 children that were rightfully spared albeit with a hell of a lot of PTSD to cope with throughout their lives as they grow up. Let's start with gender. Male, 68.9% of the 13,383 or 9,221 of them. Female, 31.1% of the 13,383 or 4,162. Let's continue with race. White, 64.1% of 13,383, or 8,578 of them. African American, or Black, 29% of 13,383, or 3,881 of them. Hispanic, 1% of 13,383, or 134 of them. Asian American, 203 of them. Other races, 5.9% of 13,383, but excluding Asian Americans from the bunch, of which I've already accounted for. 587. Religion, obviously all of them Christian of all denominations, 13,383. Family background, the number of children that would have been killed by a single mother, 5,326 children. The number of children that would have been killed by a single father, 1,164 children. The number of children that would have been killed by a married mother for not believing in Christmas? 3,640 of them. And finally, the number of children that would have been killed by a married father for not believing in Christmas? 3,253 of them. Under a year old, 3,418 children would have been slaughtered in 2017 for not believing in Christmas. 6,433 of them being under the age of 5 or between the ages of 1 and 5. 1,772 of them between the ages of 6 and 11, 1,760 of them being between the ages of 12 and 17 are children by law. Welcome to the mini-segment that will likely take the longest time to demonstrate the undying importance of statistics. Before we get down to number crunching, let's fully get to know what we're cutting off the death toll to get to 13,383. According to the Annie E. Casey Foundation's Kids Count Data Center, here's the supposed total amount of child deaths between 2016 and 2017. These are the only deaths that have been quote-unquote documented, but there were a lot of other child deaths that were not taken into account for obvious reasons. Even though just going down the page to see the disclaimers and takeaways can easily have us fully assure ourselves that we can take the data with a massive grain of salt and even bullshit. The difference between the children that were actually spared and the supposed total amount of child deaths between 2016 and 2017 is 5,616. According to CDC stacks, here are some more statistics to pause the video for. So adding all these numbers up that is within this red box, then dividing 13,383 by 42,672 gives me the fact that about 31.4% of the overall deaths the age of under 1 to 15 to 19 were prevented. But just because those deaths were prevented does not at all mean that you can say the same when it comes to the bodily, emotional, and mental trauma they faced. The absolutely, literally, ass-shredding trauma will be covered later in the series in another mini-segment known as Trauma. Welcome to the Trauma mini-segment. I'll swiftly go deep into the emotional aspect of the trauma after the child suffers the trauma of having known that these parents would have taken them out. They're emotionally scarred for life. They will never see objects like knives the same way ever again. They'll never see Christmas the same way again. And most importantly, they'll never see the centerpiece of Christmas dinner the same way ever again. Outside of that, they'll be afraid of how crazy their parents can be. They'll be afraid of Christmas. They'll be afraid of so much as Santa Claus, Rudolph, Frosty, anything relating to Christmas or anything relating to the phenomenon beforehand that they would have been additional casualties to. The Roast Game. But outside of that, 
I've already talked about the psychological, emotional, and statistical impacts of the topic of the roast game. The mental consequences, just like the psychological and emotional consequences like I've explained before, play as part of the experience of trauma. And they'll have irrational fears, and even when they're grown up in the next 10-15 years, they will still have those memories. And likely as of then, they'll even recognize me and their trauma when they were kids. Jeez, what a horrible experience you all have faced. If you all recognize me 10 to 15 years later, that would be a little weird, creepy, and even mortifying to say the least. But that'll do it for this entire last mini segment. I am not going to be talking about the roast game theory. I'm not going to be talking about the hypothetical fridge audit idea I entertained in 2022. And I'm certainly not talking about that cursed mobile home in New Lexington, Ohio, because those only concern cases when the roast game was a phenomenon in the past. Even though the ex-roast game era, when it comes to everything else, was mostly peaceful, it still does not mean that it was peaceful for everybody, much less these 13,383 children who would have added to the roast game death toll. And for those who are still confused, just think, please think for fuck's sake, and don't even dare try to argue against or deny any of this being a fact of life for these children, because it is. I'm talking about the blood stains and smears that are much less gory, but it is still equally as brutal as when the roast game was a phenomenon that happened in the past. We're talking about the ex-roast game era, that one period of time in between the roast game era and the post-roast game era. I'm talking about the shit stains smeared either all over a wall, the floor, or even splattered some portion of it on the ceiling. I know that's brutal, downright savage, and absolutely gross. What's left behind if any of these stains aren't or weren't cleaned up at all, what will continuously remind all of them the room that they all would have died in had it not been for these families or family members suddenly having a complete change of heart when it's seemingly convenient. What's left behind for them to do when they all grow up is to find out for themselves what the fuck it is that would have happened to them. All these boys and girls now will never fully know or develop cognitive abilities to fully grasp what would have fully happened to them. These stains will remind them of the time that they would have laid bare and died on the floor, like you were some afterthought of convenience for some arbitrary centerpiece meat choice for Christmas dinner. These stains will scar them for life. I don't give a fuck what any slack job idiot says on the internet, trying to argue the contrary. You're not an expert on trauma. Either of you think that pretending that you would even need to be is required to be a quote-unquote expert in the first place. Pretty sad, isn't it? Isn't it such a goddamn crying shame that absolutely nobody cares? That these children, be they white, black, Hispanic, Asian, male, and or female, will have to live with either being adopted, being orphans, or living behind times for the rest of their lives? These children will never truly live and feel that they are living fruitful lives at the same time, unlike the rest of the children that ironically survived through the roast game era with divided families, unwanted presents, food needlessly wasted, or worse, fearing that their house was on the verge of burning down to the ground and being homeless as a result in the middle of a brutal winter in the process. These children that survived throughout all of this, living as part of the first ever generation with no purpose, are afraid that the vast majority of their lives were complete and total lies. Their parents will never see through them because it's not what they see that's the problem with them. It's what the kids know that the parents don't. That the parents don't. And I highly doubt that these quote-unquote parents would have all the courage they even want to show to care about it without needlessly making their lives a living hell by either they're egotistically gaslighting them out of the conversation, leaving them homeless, threatening them with financially pulling out of their lives at the worst time, or worst, just like for these 13,383 children, taking them out entirely as well. Don't you people owe it to whatever community on the internet or real life that you were a part of to think of something fucking better than that for their lives? I would be ashamed to even exist. I would have been born decades earlier. I would have been a much more privileged son of a bitch than these unfortunate fucks that had to survive 
with most of them being in a wheelchair with a scarred or fucked up ass and with no financial support from these heartless, shameless, or pointless excuses for existences that you would call parents. Denying their existence as children that survived possibly the worst way to go out for the dumbest of fucking reasons is like the VA putting one of their own soldiers down for not believing in the very freedom they're told to protect and fight for. And for those who get to live hereafter, the trauma is still there. It is absolutely rare enough for most of the population to truly care, and nothing is going to change for these people, let alone children. Nothing will ever fucking change for these children, and that's why it's all so sad. I would have known all of this much sooner than I did had it not been for me being too young or being blindly Christian and downright ignorant. I had either the right to live a lie and regret all of what I should have known, or I have the right to be left decomposed and and drought after being slaughtered for not believing in Christmas like a fucking animal. I get chills from all of this now. That's interesting. What will be considered the end of the X roast game era, a transitional time period between the roast game era and the post roast game era. What began as a phase of trauma for a would be Christmas roast casualty or a roast game casualty, surviving and healing against all odds, is what will end with the beginning of the post roast game era, which began on Christmas Day 2017. Which is why I said that. Another roast game Christmas never happened in 2017, or simply Christmas never really happened in 2017 the way it did before. But what really led up to this sudden change of heart from families? What led to this massive fallout when it comes to the grand scheme of things, even on debate.org? Who was behind all this? that made a difference. It was me. The topic of the roast game was first introduced on October 17th, 2017, but the debate didn't take place until three days later. After this transitional phase and before the beginning of the post-roast game era, I, as of the time, Brian Mullen's No Christmas 2, on October 20th, 2017, started the first ever roast game debate on the now defunct website known as debate.org, which I won by seven points. After that, I had the second roast game debate, known as Should Christmas End? on November 29th, 2017. The fallout throughout the time the second debate was taking place was absolutely insane. But now, let's get back to the most important point of the video, the beginning of the post-roast game era. I never knew as of then how much of an impact those two debates had in the real world. I never knew that a random church bus would randomly park right where my apartment is for some weird reason, if it's totally not for stalking me or anything like that. I'm not accusing anybody of stalking, but it's just awkward how cars just randomly park right where my apartment is back in 2017, where I had to open the front door and see what was going on through the screen door. On Christmas Day 2017, after 20 years of not staying true to Christmas dinner traditions, they finally went back to either turkey or ham as the centerpiece of Christmas dinner nationwide in both America and Canada. But let's only talk about American consumption and waste statistics. For Turkey, 22,215,167 turkeys were consumed as of the Christmas of 2017. However, the amount that were wasted and not consumed at all was only 19,956,972. For ham, on the other hand, 13,545,833 of them were consumed as of the Christmas of 2017, while only 29,714,716 were wasted and shows that the waste consumption stats have changed a lot in comparison to 2016, or to be more accurate, changed entirely. What happens next now for these 13,383 children? They're left behind to marinate in their own emotions and bouts of PTSD-induced mental breakdowns. And that's about it. On the next episode of this wonderful miniseries, I'll recap everything in this one series, and I'll see you in episode 20 whilst I recap it for a final time. I'm Brian Mullins the Fox, signing out. <laughs>
Hi, everybody. I've been your host, Brian Mullins the Fox, and welcome to episode 20 of Among the 13,383 Children. Thank you all for watching this entire series. We went from demographics to statistics to commentating about the children that remain that would have been part or add to the roast game death toll. This episode will be very brief because I don't have much to say other than thanks for watching. So there, I'm Brian Mullins the Fox signing out. Hit that like button, share this entire series, and subscribe. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.